Look at that. When it comes to food, Lily suddenly becomes focused. Good sit. You want to get down? Get down. Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. We're going to start off with a story that uh, Lily wanted me to share with you because it was about adorable cat quotes adorable cats uh, the thing about cats is they bring uh, dead animals to their owners which is what Lily really wanted you to know just one more reason why you should never own a cat and there is a virologist in Florida the University of Florida named uh, John Lendicki who owns a cat named Pepper and Pepper keeps bringing dead animals uh, including, recently, an Everglades a short-tailed shrew. And his colleagues, Led Nicky and his colleagues, have been isolating viruses from these dead animals and found an unidentified real virus. So very excited about that. There's also uh, a new J-Long virus, which uh, they named Gainesville Rodent J-Long Virus 1. So if you're really into cats bringing you dead animals and weird viruses, have at it. <laughs> that is brought to you by Lily, Lily Klotman and Baylor College of Medicine. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I wanted to stop talking about measles, but you can't help talking about We just set a new record. I hit the highest number in 33 years. The risk overall is low, but it's still, you know, we, local outbreaks based on the fact that our vaccination rates aren't as good as they should be. So we hit 1,288 cases, the highest since 2019. Not surprisingly, almost all those are unvaccinated folks, 92% unvaccinated, 4% had only one dose, and 4% had two doses. So it shows that the vaccine is 96% uh, effective. Three deaths from measles, all of that unnecessary. And of course, Texas leads the way. If you look at the highest number of cases, of course, it's in the state of Texas. We have had 762 cases, and it's mostly in that, that community that was largely unvaccinated. And it, our numbers look the same as the rest of the country. Uh, of those six, 762, 94% uh, were unvaccinated, 3% had one dose, and only 3% had two doses. So vaccine, incredibly safe, incredibly effective, and yet, <laughs> spreading all over the country. So this is the vaccination uh, in various states. If you look at blue is good. We have to be at 95% or higher to prevent outbreaks. I've talked about this a thousand times. The R number for measles is very high, 18. And so in order to be protected against outbreaks, you have to be at 95%. The depressing thing about this is that the state of Mississippi is leading Texas in vaccinations. Now, any time the state of Mississippi <laughs> leads you you got to think about what you're doing. So at this point, I'd like to make a, one slight political statement. Uh, we st t I'm disappointed that our country isn't pushing safe and effective vaccines more. Uh, we should be doing a lot more. On the other hand, to point out just one or two individuals in this country is foolish because this is a long-standing problem. The rest of the world has got issues. It's like. There, this is a broad problem about vaccine hesitancy that's not just in this country and not just led by a few. It's all over the world. So if you look, this is data from measles cases before there was a change in administration and before uh, COVID up to 2019. You can see it was going up every, every year. And if you look worldwide, it's pathetic. I mean, we should be at 95%. The country is not at 95%, more like 93%. But we lead the rest of the world. The rest of the world is a mess. So this is an international, worldwide problem with vaccine reluctance and, and also just availability, but vaccine reluctance. And if you look at the top 10 countries with measles outbreaks, just over the, this last season, we are at like, you know, 1288. We're, luckily, we're doing better than Russia <laughs> and Canada. But there are countries that had 15,000 cases. And if you look at Europe, Europe has had over 127,000 measles cases. So 
it's not just us. It's all over the place. But if you're a responsible parent and you want to travel internationally with a child that's going to be potentially exposed to measles, you can see it's all over the world. You should have your kid vaccinated, or you're likely they're likely to be exposed, can be infected, and come back and start an outbreak of their own. Okay, the TEFI data is interesting. Uh, TEFI, remember, is our wastewater analysis from the state of Texas, and doesn't always reflect everything going on in the country, uh, but it looks interesting. Most of the respiratory viruses are declining. Uh, rotavirus is uh, still pretty high. That's a GI virus, and enterovirus, which is a uh, uh, the family of enteroviruses, the, the reason they're called enteroviruses is they enter through the GI tract, but a lot of them are respiratory type viruses. Uh, interestingly enough, Parvo-19 is rising nationally. In the state of Texas, it's been falling, but nationally, Parvo-19 is rising. So uh, again, interesting, it's, we're sort of in the middle of, of, of the summer with mostly declining respiratory infections, except for one. So let's talk a little bit about COVID. I, I pointed this out last week. <laughs> I, you know, occasionally even I get something right. It doesn't happen very often, as my, my team will tell me. Uh, but I was talking last week about, you know, there's this summer uh, spike in COVID that we've seen each year. And even though uh, it's been down, COVID's been down this summer, it looks to me like it was beginning to swing up. And I mentioned last week we might see a, a summer surge like we have in the past. Well... The California Department of Public Health just reported that very high levels of COVID in San Francisco. Now, not the rest of the entire state, but San Francisco is very high. And I am sure it is because of what I mentioned before. If you look at the traveler's data, that is people coming into this country, wastewater from airplanes and airports, you can see it's picking up. And what's interesting is the dominant strain is XFG, which is a child. It's related to the NB1.81, which we talked about emerging as a new variant from China and Europe, but has now evolved and taken on another additional mutation. And X, XFG is 43% of what's coming in to the United States. And this is important because if you'll see, the United States is not there yet, but we'll probably get that way. And I showed this last week, but it's worth reviewing. Remember, we're sort of up here in the K variants, and LP8 was up here in this part of the evolution. This NB1.81 was a recombination of XDV and JN1, and then evolved, had another mutation, the spike protein, to become XFG. That is the dominant strain now emerging in the rest of the world. So as long as, as, long as mutations continue to happen and the world is not immune, uh, and we don't. We should be vaccinating more and more people, not fewer and fewer. This will continue to happen. And so the CDC has actually suggested that we're probably going to see this biannual sp uh, spikes. And that's what we've seen the last several years. There's a peak that happens sort of late summer, July, August, and then a peak that happens in winter, December, January, February. And as long as the mutations are taking place, you know, that's the, the way it is. We get an immune response manage, we get immune response, or vaccinated to a current strain, it mutates, and then if it's mutating fast enough, our resistance will wane and we'll be re-exposed. And that, that's exactly what's happening. Now in the United States, if you look at the dominant strain, it is not XFG, it's NB1.81. And this data pretty much shows you that what's happening is these are coming in, these particular strains have come into the United States the United States is lagging behind, but no doubt XFG, which is now only 14%, remember it's 44% in the traveler's information, for, this will likely become the dominant strain in the U.S., something for the vaccine producers to think about. They were just going to do probably LP8, but I think probably a bivalent or maybe focused on this particular variant might be the most uh, reasonable one. And just as we were talking about, the wastewater would seem very low, but if you expand this last last analysis, most of the parts of the country are beginning to tick upward. The only one that isn't is the Northeast, but the rest of the country is beginning to slowly but surely tick upward. And then finally, uh, the FDA just granted full approval to Moderna's mRNA vaccine, uh, but again, they're limiting eligibility, which I totally disagree with. It's 65 years of age or older, 
or six months to 30, 64 years if you have an underlying condition, uh, I think everybody should get it. So I don't know why they're futzing around with that, but that's the politics of American science. Okay, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, July 1 is always that time of the year when we welcome new residents and fellows. So we were, well, they all joined us this, uh, this month. Uh, and they're obviously a key part of our healthcare delivery system. The residents or interns are new, uh, uh, newly tr uh, graduated physicians. New interns and residents take a, play an important role in managing patients, and the fellows are really a big part of our subspecialty care. Also, congratulations to uh, Dr. Radek Skoda, a senior member of the faculty of the Dan L. Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center. They received the Ernest Boitler Lecture and Prize in Basic Science from the American Society of Hematology. Uh, he is recognized for his role in identifying a common mutation in the JAK2 gene and providing mechanistic insights in the development of a group of rare blood disorders called MPNs. Uh, and also, the DeBakey VA has become the first VA to implement the, implement the new Da Vinci 5 robotic systems designed to enhance precision and control during minimally invasive procedures. And a giant shout out to Jeffrey Jones. Chief of Urology um, at the Houston VA and Professor of Urology at Baylor uh, for his uh, being able to facilitate that uh, benefit for our veterans. And then finally, congratulations to the Physician Assistance Program students who will receive their white coats tonight. Anyway, hope you have a great weekend and Lily and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>